Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, and this week, September 4th, Cloud 2030 session was about amazing what could go wrong, what topics we want to cover, what our mission and, and our values on the future of cloud. Stay tuned, the whole conversation is amazing. If you want to join in more, come to the2030.cloud, sign up and participate in our bi-weekly events. See you there. Part of the meta for this meeting is actually to discuss formats and agenda and things like that. So um, I was I had, I had thought through that an icebreaker question or a um, idea or something to discuss as a, as a hallway topic would be uh, an interesting way to start these meetings, right? Because I, I do like the, you know, unplanned agenda piece as the, as the starting, give us all some, some reconnection time. Is that, and, and so I had a potential topic for people uh, to vote on um, or talk about as an icebreaker. Um, and then what would, and people can see if they like it and then decide if we want to keep doing it. And if somebody wants to help come up with icebreakers in advance, that would be cool too. Uh, for this one, is that all right for everybody? That's fabulous. What's our icebreaker? The, so in this case, it's a, it's a poll prediction type of thing. How many people saw the video of the person singing Amazon's 200 services thing in two minutes? That thing's making the rounds no. it's pretty awesome. No, you haven't. <laughs> no. It's both awesome and horrifying. <laughs> because he, he, like speed talks 200 services and then actually says and a whole bunch more that i didn't mention at the end um what would, you know you know what that is a reference to it's a what would be, it's what would be really talk. impressive is if they did that for uh, for microsoft and google as well as amazon it would be i'm sure they're coming um, it's a reference to what rich um in the early 60s there was a a kind of a comedian pianist called Tom Lehrer. He was a physicist from Los Alamos who got famous writing these very, very satirical uh, songs. Tom Lehrer um, songs were, were pretty, pretty well circulated. Um, One, uh, welcome to another edition of the late Oops. I don't know what that was. In any case. Um, that was me trying to share to Cloud 2030 with a friend, and I accidentally started a podcast. Okay. <laughs> In any That's case, um, it, if you look him up on, uh, on the web, you'll, you'll find some of his stuff, and it's, some of it's very, very funny. That same type of, like, long... Exactly. Long. It's like this rapid-fire, you know... A piano accompaniment, and uh, it's it's quite quite satirical. Good, very very cynical sense of humor. A little bit of a dark sense of humor. I like it. I should I uh, let me see if I can find the link to the. It's a Twitter thread. I'll put it in the um, chat for for this. Oh, I'm not mirroring the chat, but so that that gave me an idea for the the icebreaker question, which is how many services do you think Amazon's going to have in 10 years? Right, they've gone up, you know, they're not, Paul can probably give us a better number of what, what the actual growth curve looks like, but uh, I would be interested in around and in going around the table and having people, you know, give an idea on, you know, do you think it's, it's, you know, 200, 2000, 20,000? 10, zero, what's the... Well, I don't think that's the right question. Yeah, all the right questions is, should they have 2,000 services? Answer it however you want. I want it as, as a... <laughs> sort of my, answer, my answer is, I am legion. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna answer it sort of the same way um, uh, Lawrence did, but to say that if 500 um, services are necessary in order to support what they think the demand from the customer is, then um, it's obviously, uh, uh, it's or to me, it means it's obvious that what they've done is they've created the equivalent of a platform that you have to piece together every time you wanna use it. And so to me, that doesn't make sense. Uh, if 
if there are 500 equivalent services, then they should find a way to turn that into 50 and turn the other 450 services into five captured options for people to select from or something roughly equivalent. Because that's, that's just ridiculous to, to uh, assume you have to know the encyclopedia of AWS before you know whether you're using the services that suit you best. I don't know if I agree with that. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that either. Look, as somebody who's in the platform business, let me just say that what you're constantly dealing with is the battle between composability and opinion. And so um, if you get too composable, Mark, you're right. If you get too composable, you get to a point where people are having to piece together their own solutions from a number of things and you get this, you know, especially in an in a, in a organization that has many different development teams, if you, you know, that you end up with a sort of smorgasbord of stuff. Uh, it's like everybody's building their own freeway from, you know, from the factory to the market. They're, they're all building their own road. That's, that's kind of ridiculous. On the other hand, if you get too opinionated, you get that problem that, um, you know, you can serve 85% of the use cases incredibly well and perfectly with your platform. Another 10% with a little bit of work and some crowbars, you can get it in there nicely. And 5% just don't work. That 5% kills the use of the platform over the long term, right? And so you need to, what, you, what I really think you're trying to do, you may end up with a whole bunch of services like AWS does. You may end up using a whole bunch of services on AWS for a complex use case. Although I would, you know, I would question whether you're deploying all of that at once, but, um, but you might end up using all of that. The question really becomes, have you looked at the ways to make sure that you're minimizing sort of that spread of repeating the same task, the same sequence of things like, I, you know, identity is always the example people throw out there and minimize the, the cases of everybody coming up with their own solution for those things while at the same time allowing as much flexibility as possible for people that have legitimate differences in their application. It's a, it's a hard, hard problem. It's why, you know, it's why half, you know, half the world out there loves Cloud Foundry, the other half thinks it's dead, right? <laughs> it's exactly that reason. So, I mean, I, I, I accept the argument and I'm, of course, I'm anxious to hear because uh, I'm always looking for folks that will tell me I'm stupid. Um, and I, I'm certain that, um, oh, Mark, let me vote. exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was, I was pointing at you, my friend. You um, come to the right but, audience, Mark. But before, before you do tell me I'm stupid. Um, uh, so to take what uh, James said a little bit further and even what uh, uh, Rick said uh, from um, a, a text uh, standpoint is, to me, the, making this number of services is uh, effectively just another way to uh, help customers define environments that are impossible to define anywhere else. Mm. Possible. Simple. And, and simple. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's yeah. because it offers a benefit that is worthy and no one else can support that benefit. I don't know. But I think when you get to that kind of volume, at a, at a minimum, you're talking about, you know, 90% of the users of the platform will never use more than 10% of the tools. I think and that's fair, Mark. That's an absolutely it. fair yep. statement. Right. Just doesn't, think, that, doesn't that sound uh, like Microsoft that Word? Diagram, exactly, that's what, that was my reference. Yeah, yeah. but then Word, like but Word fell like, like fell. boom, because people showed up and were like, I just need basic word processing. And the feature I really want is collaboration and Google Docs like zipped in on the side. Right. Well, having oh, good. Now, but Google features. Docs is building all the feature set of Windows, of, of Microsoft <laughs> they are, they are, they are. over time, right? Because <laughs> they're trying to capture that that last five or 10% of right. the use cases, right. Right? right? And nobody uses more than 5% of the features. We just all use a different 5%. That's right. the thing. The Venn diagram covers the whole spectrum. AWS yeah. is not, I mean, you know, they. I'm still surprised to this day that they haven't shut down Simple DB, but it's because they have users of Simple DB that find it useful for stuff that that they don't think is as useful as Dynamo DB, right? And so, I'll give you, um, I'll, I'll give so you one. I associate the Amazon product sprawl with, okay? And, and it, to me, to me, it's not about, it's not about you know um, the mess. It's about being. Um, indisruptible okay so what what amazon is doing is 
is fending, fending off disruptive innovation by by effectively co-opting the ecosystem. So, and that, that's a development culture inside of Amazon Web Services, right? So there's nothing, you, you think of a great idea and you're gonna disrupt, you're gonna disrupt AWS the way that, you know, Google Docs disrupts, you know, on-prem word processors or the way that AWS disrupted the, the previous dinosaurs of the client server era. Um, Amazon is building a, an indisruptible business model. And that's why you see the, the proliferation of thousands of different services out there because their ability to bring something to market is like we've never seen before. I mean, I, you know, before, you know, I, I'll think of something and I'll build a prototype and fucking Jesus, like, like they're, they're already in market before I even breathe it to anybody. Yeah. Like, they're, uh, they're reading, they're reading your mail is what it is. Well, uh, having been inside AWS too, right? Listening to your home vo home conversations too. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead, James. No, so, so having been inside AWS for a while too, I will say it sounds like John, you have some experiences to a certain extent as well. But I mean, it is absolutely the, the, here's the number one thing that's different about AWS that enables this, and why you will constantly see these services pop up. Um, Never once in the almost two years that I was there did I hear Andy Jassy say, this is our strategy for the coming year. Everybody line up with this strategy. Mm -hmm. It never, ever happened. What happened was all of the individual groups said, this is our strategy right. for the coming year. They bubbled that up. It got, it got rationalized and reconciled with other things. And eventually a document ends up at the top that says, essentially, this is our strategy for the year. And then the headcount bubbles down, right? Basically, the budget bubbles down. Never an edict to say, thou shalt. Now, you may not get the money you want to do to do what you want to do, which is, a, you know, a, an equivalent in a sense. But I would, so they are constantly exploring these are the new opportunities. And you all know about the, you know, the, the six-pager, five-pager, six-pager document thing, the, the write the press release first, whereas anybody in the company, literally anybody can say, here's a product idea I have, and I did the research. And here's why I think there's a business model that works for it. That's what, that's what makes them so goddamn hard to disrupt. Exactly. So, that's a, and and to, to my last point on this, and then I'll shut up. That's the a topic. Is, my last point yeah. on this is simply that this is this is a prime example of the resilience versus stability trade-off, right? Amazon is building to be resilient. They don't care about stability. They care about resilience more than anything, and um, and that's to to John's point. That's why they're so hard to disrupt because they don't. I don't care if they look unstable. Market resilience. It's market resilience as well as technological. Yep. Agreed. But that's not going to stop me from trying. And that's why I get out of bed every day. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But that's yeah. wait, wait. So so I'm I am I'm gonna keep us on, on track a little bit. I am super delighted by the by the conversation. Just as a quick like to wrap it up, um, and not everybody has their camera on, but if you do, can people do a I think there's more thumbs up that I think it's going to stabilize thumbs you know, flat or uh, I, I think it's going down and just just so we can do a quick visual like yep nope or what are we what's going do you think do you think that that Amazon is, it, is going to Mark is going up in number of services do you think they're plateauing in number of services or do you think they're going to start right reconciling it down in number of services just thumbs up pointer Interesting, John. Wait, which one are we picking? Are we which picking? Up for up, what? Amazon, more services, oh. flat or down? I right. All right, thank you. I uh, fascinating to uh, Rob. Could I for yeah. for our future discussion? Sure. I think it's still open for discussion. Whether or not um, having more services is going to enable uh, create a. Uh, enable uh, AWS to be able to move forward quickly with new technologies or to have, will it limit innovation like it did at Microsoft and other companies? Um, people were talking mm. about how AWS is different. I'm not really sure if that's gonna be the case long-term. Um, that might be wishful thinking. And so what, what we're actually, this is not intentionally, but is a seed for the topic for next week, which is, yeah. The, the topic for next week is what what are the things that could break or disrupt the incumbents that we have today? So what's it's the disaster planning scenario. 
Um, and none of these are one one hour topics. Right. They're all going to. So we're the the goal for any one of these topics is to leave us with two or three new topics, and ideally somebody to carry them forward. Today we we had a meta conversation lat two weeks ago. Um, and so I wanted to put a bow on the meta conversation so that we can start doing some real planning. And my, my goal is to have other people helping lead these topics so that we distribute the, the prep load. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a lot of prep load, but I, I know we all benefit from a, somebody coming through and, and, and thinking through what the agenda is and what some of the topics are, and then ideally seeding some um, ideas on social media for us to sort of prime the pump with and get get talking um let me give you the better piece i just want to so say that yeah. james looks great as luke skywalker from the last star wars movie <laughs> <laughs> no that's i'm trying to keep up because in, in uh, college i was literally like people would walk up to me in parties and be like oh my god luke skywalker and was like, <laughs> no no so now i'm like okay i'm reaching that age where where the movie's telling me what, what I need to do again. You just need to put on a long hoodie and you're, you're in. Man. You're it. <laughs> and mind tricks do not work. But I got to look, I got to look, look, look a little bit less satisfied with life, right? Like, That's right. <laughs> Disappointed in all your, in all yeah. your uh, Jedi get good, trainees. Get a good furrow going. <laughs> oh, Here, sorry. this background is for you, James. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh yeah, we can all switch to the space. Hold on, guys. Yeah, I do. There you go. Ah, that's not space. We'll all, we'll all switch the space themes for you. Oh, so, you're gonna love mine. Did I did I hear it correct? We're gonna have a we, let's, we should have a topic on the disruptability of the incumbents. I, that's actually the next next week's topic is about um, sort of that disaster planning. What could go wrong? And I think the right place to start is disrupt disruptability and res resourcefulness of incumbents. So I think I think those are good good topics from that perspective. And hold on, I have to make this. And this. we're using the word disruptability in the sense of in the in the in the you know in the classical sense of disruption, right? Or are we talking about like physical going offline disruption? Yeah, are you talking about market disruption or you're talking about operational disruption, Ron? I think both are really interesting. Um, to me, the question for 2030 as a whole is market disruption. Mm -hmm. The topic for, for next week to, was more physical or governmental disruption. I think like outside, I probably, so outside disruption. Yeah, I think you could probably put those two together, um, but not necessarily with market disruption. Agreed. I mean, you could, you could, you could claim security threat or government disruption or, um, or global weather disruption or something Social like Social collapse that. disruption. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, if we're, if we're going to talk about, okay, there's, so there's classical market disruption, which I think is a very relevant topic and, and a very big topic for cloud. Mm -hmm. But the other disruption that I think is also relevant for cloud 2030 is more of the, the which is becoming an increasingly hot topic. And that is the breakup of the incumbent monopolies. So I think of like that from, from that kind of disruption. So, yeah. The separation and segregation of, of these monoliths that we've allowed to form around us, even though. So would you would you would you think, John, that that would be included in in uh, market disruption or in government interference or disruption? It's non-market disruption. Market disruption to me is you know somebody comes a plucky startup comes along and 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 solves a market that the incumbents can't touch because they're too busy you know uh, making money big money from big customers and you right. know. You know, in the classic Clayton Christensen sense of disruption. Yep. Uh, um, but disruption is, you know, you know, calamitous slash, you know, you can use the word government and calamitous almost interchangeably. Um, so whether it's regulatory disruption or, you know, catastrophic disruption, I think that's all part of one stream of consciousness. So we we can measure. Are, this is the this is either going to be the teaser reel for the for the next meeting, or I'm just going to give up and we're going to have the discussion. <laughs> so we 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 can actually watch watch where the clouds are investing in new infrastructure based on political environment. Um, Hong Kong, uh, London, rest of Europe, um, South Africa. So we we see new regions lighting up and. 
uh, old regions languishing, not getting any new equipment. So they're, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cloud giants are already responding to political environment. Um, they're big enough that, you know, uh, I, those of us who were watching the news last week that I think uh, Facebook and Google share a fiber that was supposed to come on shore in Hong Kong. They're not doing that anymore. Yep. Uh, they have to figure out where they're going to onshore that cable now, but they're not going to onshore it in Hong Kong. Of Hong Kong, yeah. That makes so sense. there's there is a there is a geopolitical bent around this to and suggest you know you know do you do does everybody here believe that China is going to sit idly by while the Americans uh, you know put up the blockade for digital assets in their economy? Because I don't know what happens, quite frankly, to Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple if China says ah yeah sorry um, you know what you can you can work in our market however. You need to sell 51% of your company to Alibaba. No, I think it's already happening, though. I mean, I've been reading a couple of different articles about the fact that China pretty much has a, its own tech stack from the network on up, from TCPI on up, basically. It's got, um, you know, it's, it's, it's building out its own languages. It's building out its own uh, service sets. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly they can isolate their internet no problem now and the, the entire country and, and, and any other country they want to let in is uh, could easily continue to, to operate without having any U.S. infrastructure involved. I think that um, right, so all of that to me tells me that and, and I've heard Russia is trying to do the same thing right now. They're trying to build a, a completely independent um, Internet capability for their country and for anybody they want to let in as well. Russia's so, done. They disconnected. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's wow. not just the internet, it's, it's uh, social media, it's um, all yeah. the stuff on top all of it stuff. as well. Yep. Right, Russia's effectively a large subnet that just carved itself off and left. Right. Yep. But, but China, I mean, wow. China literally, we talk about all these open source projects and how important they are here in North America. I mean, I literally sit here and think like, oh, I'm working on the core of what the internet's all about. And then, you know, I've been reading these articles that say, no, it's bullshit. I mean, China, they're not using very much of any of the stuff that I'm working on. <laughs> right? Um, they're, that, they're, they've got their they're, own. I, you, they're not depends, using the... That depends, I, on the, that depends on the layer, James. Really. Yeah. Um, no, it does. It's, it's more, the lower you get towards TCIP, the more they share stuff. But the higher you go up, the more it differentiates. That's true. That's true. But there are some, there's some key aspects there that... I think really need to be addressed. The other thing that's potentially backfiring on them is their access to kind of key Western sources of um, technology and intelle in intellectual property. The, the whole issue with Huawei getting access to the right kinds of, uh, of silicon, um, the way China right now is having a real hard problem with all of the ARM architectures. They have, after ARM was sold to SoftBank, um, SoftBank tried to make, has tried to make real inroads into China, actually creating a, a quote, Chinese uh, operation where it's 51% owned by by China, but it was stage managed by um, Son, and it's turned into a complete mess. And they are objecting. The people who have to make use of ARM technologies are now, you know, in complete uproar in China. So it's not altogether working, you know, to isolate themselves at the various levels. To your point. The higher up you go, the tougher it is to break in if you're from the outside. Yeah. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, we we have this assumption that we that we know and we are in the, the heart and the soul of how the future of 2030 is going to happen. It's not a single Chinese technologist on this call. There's not a single Russian technologist, as far as I know. Please raise your hand if I'm wrong yeah. on this call. And the fact <laughs> of the matter is, is that uh, that's where I think the hole is. That's where I think the gap is, is. I think we don't know the outside influence that's actually going to come from two other countries that are, I mean, Russia less so than China, but two other countries that are very much trying to build their own um, silicon story that with technologies that they control. 
The other question to ask is how much of a change in the next 10 years will there be to focus on OT as opposed to IT? And then what does that mean to the, the respective mm -hmm. roles of mm -hmm. China, Russia, or any other kind of regulated boundary around operational technologies as opposed to IT? Actually, all of the IoT, all of the, um, a lot of the, what is called edge today. Is smart cities, smart issue. cars, smart freeways, all uh, smart airlines. I mean, that's exactly. you know, all or airways. Yeah. Agree, I agree with that. And what I think that actually starts to get back to Rob's initial question is, you know, about disruption. And we were talking about market disruption or technical disruption it starts to say that one of the design principles for building next generation systems services is going to be focused on disruptability and building in the whole notion of just the way Netflix started to build its systems on the basis of there will be failure the thing that you now have to deal with is there will be disruption. It's like building a 3PL or 4PL logistics system. You start by watching, you know, the itinerary and then figuring something is going to go wrong. I've got to continue to think about and anticipate there will be a delay here. There will be a, 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 a missed connection there that will be among the most important design principles in the next round of, of applications, especially with meshed networks and meshed applications, distributed applications. When did that not become a design principle? Uh, because for <laughs> no, me, that, that was the, one of the original principles of, of the internet before we started building all these clouds. Um, That's yeah, I know I was there. The, um, the the point that I'm making though is that is the at the applications and in operational terms, that was you know it it's a difference between business. There's a difference between continuity and actually building in and planning from the outset um, disruption and building in the you know for the operational components of it the notion of here's how I deal with it. Here's how I must deal with it. And we're talking about its influence on the physical world, on the world outside of the networks. You're absolutely right. When you know we were putting together ARPANET, uh, it was all about, uh, I want to be immune to various kinds of disruption. Now we're talking about the applications of these, of these systems of, and software to our our real lives, our physical lives. So well, it does seem like that type of disruption is very different than disruptability that we were talking about before with like the business models of Amazon and yeah. big tech. It's, it's almost like that's a separate thread. You know, thinking about how in the early 90s, there were literally hundreds of internet service providers that we're contending with things like you're talking about, Rich, um, and yet we saw this massive consolidation uh, that was really driven by the business model and by the market, as opposed yeah. to the physical disruption. And, and what well, I'm and, saying and is that the business model, regulatory, yeah. the business model, and regulatory issues, statutory issues, um, are going to are going to emphasize that resilience is almost designed, is defined by starting out as starting place in a design, kind of a design, a design. Yeah, I, think, I, I think we're gonna see project. that. We're, we're definitely gonna see that. If you think about, um, uh, you know, in, in the age of COVID, we had this issue come up around uh, supply chain fragility in terms of, of availability of supplies with China being the world's largest producer of, of masks, for example. Uh, analogously, you could look at Amazon 
Amazon as creating supply chain uh, fragility in a digital space, in the cloud space. Right. And um, I, I think that's something that ultimately is going to play into uh, Cloud 2030 from a regulatory perspective as well. Yeah, completely. I would, I would completely agree. And one of the, the anti-patterns is going to be the enforced breakup and market disruptions in some of the physical and the, and the uh, technol technological systems that are going, that's going to actually incorporate more fragility and more um, aspects of kind of susceptibility to disruption. And that's a, that, that whole balancing act is not an easy one to deal with. And generally one that regulators and lawmakers don't take into account. They don't know how to. Is, is the death of net neutrality, I mean, back to the US, got different, you know, most internet is government controlled in other countries, if I'm correct, right? In European, it's, it's really a telephone service, telephone or, or utilities managed by the government. And I think that's the pattern in most places besides the US. If we take down net neutrality and big companies start actually prioritizing traffic or blocking traffic to competitors, um, could we see a backlash that would then reopen things up? Would that, you know, what trigger what triggers a, a change from that perspective? What kind of backlash are you thinking of? Or we're, we're already starting to see some of that with uh, people complaining about Amazon Basic uh, disrupting the businesses of their supplier ecosystem in the e-commerce space uh, with smart speakers. That's another great example of how Amazon. And, and Google and the other big players were able to co-opt uh, technology of their ecosystem partners. Uh, and and who, was that you, Rob, that shared that article about um, uh, uh, creating yeah. channel conflict with the VMware uh, Mark uh, reseller? Mark, Mark, I think it was Mark or Mike Manny originally, but yeah, yeah. Mike Manny came from Mike. Uh, uh, I'm going to volunteer for maybe in a month from now to lead a discussion on stuff about public policy issues. Uh, people probably don't know this, but 20 years ago, I ran a company called the Internet Public Policy Network, connecting to the leading experts in the world on e-commerce, telecom regulation, privacy policy issues. And so basically, um, I'm very, I, I have a lot of background in this topic. So... Um, what maybe we could do is after we start talking about these other types of market disruption, we could maybe come back to this and get in, go into a lot more detail. Um, because otherwise, maybe we'll just uh, get, keep on talking for forever. So yeah, tell, tell Rob, just, I, just I would ask message, me, I would message me for something. Seventeenth to the twenty fourth. Just pick pick one of the dates and we'll 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 do it. I I think that's great, and and I'm going to use that as a as a as a break. I, I actually do have an agenda, um, but I'm happy to do, this conversation is very similar to what, or the start of what I was planning to do next week. Um, I don't mind doing, a, you know, keep going and doing a couple other sessions. Uh, I would have gone into like environmental disruptions and some, some things that could have caused widespread changes to more distributed infrastructure for next week. Um, we got really activated la la two weeks ago about mission and format. And I, I, I do want to make sure that we cover that enough because, you know, the, the, the sessions are going to be much more interesting if we have people who are like, I really want to talk through, you know, networking or edge or hybrid cloud or, you know, uh, data sovereignty and security as topics. And so, you know, I don't, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I really do want us to be able to say, these are topics of interest. And these are, you know, these are speakers that we want to come in and, and be available for that conversation or lead that conversation. Um, because I, right, I, my network, y'all are, y'all are in my network, obviously, we need to get, you know, broader. And I think, uh, Rich, I think it was your point, someone's point, you know, we need not just U.S., People, right. Yeah. The goal is to expand expand the horizon. I'm trying to do this in a time zone friendly way for Europe. Um, 
at least. No, and usually, actually, China, this is good for China too, China and Asia. So, so bro, I, you know, I think I, I like, I love this idea. This is like this whole virtual cloud twenty thirty format. I think is awesome, and and it, it creates a lot of repeatability. We can cover a lot of topics with high frequency, which is great. Um, the one, the one thing that I, I you know, I, I think we should try and preserve is is these topic focuses that there there can be um, opposing views or contention. Like, I don't think anybody wants to, you know, gather for an hour or two and all, you know, just, you know, everybody agree. Yeah, this is what we're <laughs> happen. No, that's fair. I, I just think- I, that, I, I agree, but oh. I disagree with that. Yes, I, yes. <laughs> I think, you know, somebody to volunteer to take a point counterpoint style discussion. I think that's what makes it really informative. Like if we're gonna talk about, like disruption is a, is a great one. Um, there are lots of topics. There's net neutrality. There's, you know, there's, there's the future of the carriers. Like we haven't even begun to talk about 5G slicing and new radio and these kinds of things that I think are going to be fascinating as, as, um, as this all takes shape. Um, we haven't talked about, we haven't, you know, there, there are just, there's so many different topics that around, around the next 10 years that, you know, we can have a very, you know, the, the, the product of these conversations should be really informed discussion on either side of, of a topic, right? Because, you know, um, I mean, if we, if we all just get, you know, get together and discuss how great Mark Tilly is, it'll be a quick meeting. Yeah, he's awesome. But next, you know, see? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so to, but to me, part of doing that is we're going to have, you know, people you know, the people y'all came because you're interested in the discussion and yeah. the discussion more generally. For some of these things, like what we do at the DevOps things on Tuesday, right? You know, we bring, we try to bring in somebody who has really deep knowledge on a topic mm -hmm. um, and then we, and go super deep with them. So we need to have enough of a schedule and prep that you can sort of lay out, lay out those foundations so that you know to come, you know, it's, it's, it's a, we're, we're, there's a lot of meetings. Frankly, yeah. they're fun. I look forward to them, but yeah. we could have at you least have to we could know have, which ones you're going to, which ones you can skip. For sure. There's lot, lots of tracks, lots of like different topic tracks that can go deep on various things. Right. But right. De deconstructed conference is the way I usually think about it. I think that's a great idea. So, so what I would ask is, it's, you know, not take, I'd, I'd rather not take a lot of time on meta. It's just me, but I, we do need to talk about the meta. So there, there, th in this doc, we have tracks and questions. And I think what I'm, what I'm trying to do is line those up with tracks in the uh, Mighty Networks piece so that we can collect topics and have, you know, sort of pull materials into the tracks when we have those conversations. I really like Mighty Networks better than the other stuff because it, it, it actually does a good job of collecting like if I tweet something, it's gone inside of a three hour window, but we can, we can actually collect a, a thread better in this. That's what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, it is like an unconference format. Um, just spread out. So I, I, and actually I would love to have people look at that list. We can read through it really quickly in a minute um, and, and add to it. Um, please do not add if we're going to add a track, we should discuss if we want to add a track. Too many, you know, once we get over seven or eight tracks, it's people's heads are going to, we're going to lose, lose things. So I'm okay to collapse tracks into smaller units. Um, and then the other, the other meta things to do is to think through, um, I think everybody's okay with the agenda style. Um, Y'all responded amazingly to the, polling and the, that great icebreaker type question. And so I would, I'd love to keep, keep going with that. Um, I, I took a shot. This was based on Tim and I talked for an hour um, about some of these things and he kept coming back to uh, having a vision of what, what we think is happening. And so I took a shot at sort of summarizing our conversation into five key points about what, what we think the 2030 cloud is going to look like or what we, not what it's going to look like, what we, what we hope it will become. Um, and so I, I, I tried to document that. That is me sort of boiling up themes I've heard uh, us talk about. Um, they feel, to be very frank about it, they feel very, um, uh, they're, not, they're not particularly technical. 
from that perspective. They are they are about society. They're society level type of, of things, um, which I think is right for us. And so, you know, part of part of my concern on this is that you know we're doing this because we want to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. the, the, let me read them and then I'll shut up and let people give me feedback and discuss. Um, so what I identified were five things uh, that, that we're looking for 2030 to be innovative. And by that, I don't just mean cool gadgets that make rich, you know, rich billionaires, richer billionaires, but actually things that solve problems for people, like improve society as a whole, like breakthroughs in solar power or something like that, um, energy in general. Um, democratic, and I mean democratic in the user sense that it's the people, the users making the decisions, not the, not a select group of uh, star chamber technologists making decisions. Uh, open, and open is not open source, but transparent and accountable. So, you know, like we're having a lot of challenges with AI that happens in a vacuum. Um, AI and openness are, are, I think, current topics, but I think this is going to be an ongoing thing for 2030. Equitable, so that we don't create uh, technology ghettos where people don't have any access to technology and it's, it's a problem. Um, ubiquitous would be another word to describe it. Um, I think technology can be ubiquitous without being equitable, so I'm happy to have that conversation. Um, and shared. So it's not all controlled by one or two or three companies um, from that perspective. And we can argue about any, the meaning of any of these things, but does that, am I missing something? Does that capture you know, what it, we it, hope 2030 looks like? I think the only thing I can see missing is, um, and it's not a security specifically for viruses or, but it's, it's gotta have some kind of inherent integrity maybe a better word um it can't can't be intentionally disrupted either the discussion or the infrastructure right i like integrity that is not that is a good ad am i off base does this help us frame discussions so we can come come back and say, if that happens, is that equitable? Right. That that's. I mean, the goal here is right. We come. We should be able to come back to principles, and ask a question about, you know, one of these six six items and say, all right, does that get us to this point? Is that an improvement? Might be a little bit orthogonal, um, Rich, but I mean, I, I think it makes sense. Uh, I guess the uh, only question I would uh, offer um, and, and why I think it might be orthogonal, uh, maybe unimportant, is um, uh, how many different um, themes do we want to bring to the questions or to the team that are addressing the different questions? Um, I, I may have missed um, some of the items that you identified as, as talking points and focus points, but mm -hmm. when I think about the, some of the things that we first discussed when we were first talking about even setting this up, let alone other discussions, they were themes around, um, you know, where, what's our place um, in the world relative to our responsibility for what's being created? Um, what's uh, our responsibility to, um, the next wave of uh, potential employees or the, the wave of employees that is trying to make do at advanced age, like yours truly, um, or, you know, impact on uh, climate change or assumptions of how we should focus um, our energies in those areas as a larger community. Uh, and, I, and I realize that any one of those things is a huge conference all by itself. So I'm just throwing it out there, seeing whether or not those and others make sense. And, you know, I, uh, and I, I think we've even talked about this. Some of you maybe even uh, have, have talked about this with me in the past. I wrote a paper on democratization of IT through cloud. And I believed it at the time, right? 
But when you, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm jumping a little bit, but not too far, when you hear about um, kids who can't actually get an equivalent education, people who can't actually effectively compete because they're forced to work or school from home because they don't have the tools still today to make that access equitable and, and at least on par with what is considered ex acceptable by those of us with you know 100 megabit plus access and the latest computers, et cetera, is that we, we certainly made um, computing more democratized, but we continue to, to develop stratification that um, uh, still leaves an enormous part of the population behind, unfortunately. So again, all very big topics and maybe nobody else cares, but those are some of the things that uh, at some point I would love to incorporate into uh, a discussion with uh, so many illustrious uh, intellects. And alliterative. Alliterative. Good points. Very good points. I think what you just described is a lot of what's gonna, what those are potential disruption or what do you call it, lovers for disruption. I think we're not even considering a lot of the things we take for granted today. I assume right. a lot of things are gonna be changing. You know, yeah. just, just in general, is it, is our current environment scalable? Is it stable enough to continue forward for 10 more years without having it, without being disrupted? It's, you know, the probability is not there. So it's really interesting to be a part of this group and hear all the different ideas and different perspectives. It's very nice. So appreciate Rob the invite. This is this is awesome. Glad you good go. stuff. Yep. Yeah. That's Thank you. Good. So so I want to. We'll keep refining this, and I think this is part of when we. You know, I want to. Gina's Gina's stepped forward to talk about lead on the programmed inequity, and so we can go back to this as part of programmed inequity. Um, and use that as a starting point for this. So we will we'll we'll start schedule. I'll work with her and schedule some uh, programmed inequity topic conversations so we can go go into that. Rob, just yeah. a quick, uh, just a response to your last bullet. The uh, the notion of shared, but the explanation being non monopolistic. <laughs> that um, we should do better. Yeah. That needs to be. That needs to be. That needs to be. Uh, renovated somehow. Um, I what think, think what you're going at there is the notion of either ownership, control, or um, kind of the um, kind of cloud, well, it's the economies and the, and the businesses of, of what we're dealing with, and that goes in, in layers. Um, I think that's that's interesting. All of these are good. What about adding to this? Sure. I'll, I'll call them disciplines or, or kind of approaches. I mean, we're about to deal with major changes to the way we think about economics, value, how value is actually traded how it you know shows up in markets and, and and becomes exchanged. I mean, just the idea that ten years from now we actually could be seeing companies that are putting data as an asset on their on their books in a real way, um, thinking about the ways in which um, metadata changes the value of a physical good um, or the price paid for a physical good because it's taking into account um, things like climate change. If I, buy a, if I buy a barrel of oil that is responsibly extracted, am I willing to pay more money for that than a barrel of, the same barrel of oil in terms of chemistry that has actually been improperly or or lazily extracted and I've got you know more than more methane release than I, I ever wanted from from an LNG or things like this. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a kind of a sense that our 
the learning that comes out of a lot of what's going on in the past 10 years and what's going to come up in the next 10 leaves us with a different set of kind of disciplines or disciplinary approaches to how we make decisions, how they're governed. I, and Rich, this is to me, what you just described is the start of a, of what I've been, what I put under the data sovereignty, this cloud economics question, but I, you just expanded it to include data. Yeah, in much property. bigger than that. Oh, it is. <laughs> data, so, sovereignty, data, data sovereignty is a is a corner in that one. <laughs> and in know, some respects, this is a reworking the, of GDP as well. So what's, yeah, what's there's the that. track? What's the is the top level track just economics? Where do I put security? Well, it no, might, it might the, end. The, the top level track is data monetization. Uh, um, it's oh, not just monetization. Monetization is a, is also a factor there, but it's. You know, you can talk about data and information economics as opposed to the economics of data and the economics of information. Um, these are these are these are two different things, and I, I wish I had a good I wish I had a good title for you. But Rich, what is the, Rich? Well, we'll, we'll work on we'll work on the title as we go. But Rich, can you yeah, yeah. Do you want to pick a, a Thursday morning and and tee up the topic for us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Real quick, what what is the the uh, the economics of information? What does that mean? Um. Well, let me distinguish two things: the economics of information and information economics. Mm -hmm. The economics of information might be the way in which the market is responding, how how data markets, how information markets, how it's bought, sold, how it's valued so forth, as it actually shows up in markets, in marketplaces. Information economics or data economics is more the disciplinary aspect. How do you ascribe value? How do you, how does it change value? How does it work in a, in a more, um, how do you take an abstraction and actually make use of it in things like um, writing laws, putting regulation in place, so forth? I'll 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 tell you what, John. I'll I've got a I've got a long series of notes that I've been trying to pull together on kind of distinguishing the two, and I'll I'll would, use I, that as maybe would, part of what we're talking about. If you're okay with sharing, Rich, I would I am dying to read this. Well, this is this is something that's been on my mind for twenty years. So, we'll, we'll call that episode "Burning Chrome." <laughs> <laughs> well, sound, I don't want to sound crazy, but in in this company, I feel like it's okay. But what if what if data was the actual future gold standard? What if that was the thing in which we could actually price economies? Well, that gets to the point of. Um, information or data economics, not the economics of data, but the first. Yeah. And yeah, no, it, it's, it's really, really slippery because of the nature, the, the economic nature of data. But it, right now, we've, we've got, you know, just a, the barest of handles on that. Yeah. Well, isn't part of the problem there, though, the data has this intense half-life, like, crazy intense oh. half-life when it comes to value 90 90 95 of data yeah, has some of it value. does and some right? yeah, and this yeah. Is, this it's is... fair it's fair it's fair there's some of it does have value over the long term but yeah. but i you know part of the issue really becomes identifying the data that has the right. long-term value on which to build um and, or something like that because otherwise simply... you know I, let me. I, and I, I would have. I would have agreed with you much more. You know, just right down the line, mm -hmm. uh, ten years ago, when yeah. I now see that the the value of data, the long term value of data, some of which we really used to think of as exhaust, mm -hmm. has now been changed. Cool. When I think about the fact that timed series time, basically longitudinal data 
that is accretive is being used to train AIs. Think yes. about the data, the value of exactly that data set where it's not just a resource that's being mined. Sure. It is sure. actually getting to the point where we're talking about um, it's inference. Data, data is code. Infer yeah. Inference is what changed that for me, Rich. Okay, so inference, right? So, you know, the, the learning systems, the data lakes, the inference capabilities, that's where, that's where, that's what changed everything. And it's not like I used, I used to think about it by, you know, applying the traditional uh, frame of reference for economics and pricing markets and these kinds of things. And that's not the way to think about it. Yeah, I, I think we're side of that completely. What we yeah. what in some sense we've created here is um, a place where the, the nature of the value of data, very much the way James has just laid it out, and it still applies to the great bulk of data. Well, I'm definitely uh, going to want to jo join the conference call next week because this is a great topic and uh, we could certainly spend an hour on it. <laughs> More than that. I'm not, no doubt about this, that. I'm not going to do this next week because you've already got a topic going, right? Right. Well, so you just post to the lake for need the to, alternative need to data council. Know, uh, yeah, and then, Paul, that alternative data, those cloud providers are one of the major providers of alternative data to the rest of the industry. And that's a real privacy concern for the, that another topic. We can that. talk all about that. That's my business is monetizing. We're, we're, we're going to have some good conversations. Everybody, <laughs> yeah. thank you. We got topics for the next three months. And we're, we are set. I'm going to be tapping on people for, for speaker roles. It helps me if you just come forward and remind me, but otherwise I'll, I'll hunt you down. Otherwise. Um, yeah, Rob, I want to talk to you about the one you just tagged me to, because I don't think it's the right one for me, but I think I have a much better one and, and we can talk. Then move your name. That'd okay. be great. I, I just, I'll add it. And just delete it. it, move it. Tell me what you want to do. I'm not, I'm, I'm cool. Later. trying to share the All load, right. but I'm not trying to impose. Where are you Fair keeping enough. that list, Rob? It's in the document in the link. I'll post it. It's it's actually in the 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 chat thread for Cloud Twenty Thirty. Yeah, is it in the um, mission uh, the mission and topics? So if if you go to chat, yeah, I, I, I'm there. Okay, um, yeah, mission and topics. Sorry, that's right. the title okay. of the document. <laughs> I, I see it. All right, Got down it. at the bottom. Yeah, put your yep, name yep, in. Yep. And I'm already I'm kind of already on top of. On you, you just you just need to tell me what what week you want to do it, and we'll 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 uh, we'll go from there. And yeah, tweak for edit however however it makes sense. Uh, Thanks for putting this together again, Rob. Appreciate of it. Of course, I, this is fun. Makes isn't me it fun? Think. Isn't it fun? I, it's what I missed about it's it's everything I missed about conferences with none of the stuff I don't like about conferences. So, including the travel, <laughs> including the conference itself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never went to any sessions anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. All right, everybody, it's good. Bye. Bye.